WNBC TV Public Affairs, in cooperation with the Archdiocese of New York and the Paulist Fathers, presents Inquiry. Our topic today, Jackie Gleason Talks Religion, the second of two conversations with our special guest, Jackie Gleason. Here is our host, Father James Lloyd. My mother and father, who are old-time vaudevillians, used to tell me that in show business there's an old saying that a fella says, boy, I could really play those drums. Just give me those sticks and I can do a terrific job. Until he starts to use the sticks and finds them a little difficult. Similarly, in the area of theology, practically everybody, every taxi driver you meet, figures he's a theologian. This morning, though, we have somebody who can use those drumsticks very well and also He's a very good theologian. I'm talking about our guest for this morning, whom we had last Sunday, as you know, Mr. Jackie Gleason. So, Jackie, I want to thank you again for coming back with us two Sundays in a row to do this dialogue on the meaning of religion. Well, thank you, and I'm amazed <laughs> that you have invited me back. <laughs> Jackie, I'd be crazy if I didn't. You know, last week, though, we, we were kind of cut on something that I, I think we were getting on something awfully important about... Uh, you had mentioned a priest uh, to whom uh, you had talked about your personal life, and he had uh, told you why you should keep on coming back, uh, even though one should uh, slip up here or there. One keeps on coming back. This is one of the things that I, I'd like you to talk about, your views on uh, what I would call almost the constant resurrection uh, of the spiritual life. Well, uh, I can use a, a, a simile in my, in my professional life. When I first began in show business, I was very bad at it. I but, find it hard to believe. Well, I was. And, uh, uh, but I had a dream. I wanted to be a big star and be successful in show business. And even though I was bad, even though my performances were of very poor quality, I kept doing them and kept working at it. And suddenly, uh, I began to transform into an adequate performer and from an adequate performer to a good performer. And I say that with all the ego at my command. No, this is... And I think that the same thing applies to uh, religion of any kind. Uh, nobody's going to be good at it in the beginning. Very few people. But if you keep at it, and you keep subjecting yourself to the atmosphere of religion, uh, you must become better. You must uh, become uh, more adept at believing, uh, more adept at doing good, uh, more adept at uh, refusing sin. And the first thing you know, you become uh, a star. An eternal star, I think so. Jackie, you know, as you're talking to, I, I, again, the the thought always crosses my mind here about how close uh, the subject we're discussing, this business of religion, uh, is to the business of psychiatry. Uh, in both areas, I, I read the, the ancient writers, and I read the modern writers, and these fellows in two fields are saying almost the same thing, that self-knowledge is so awfully important, this self-honesty, if we are going to integrate ourselves and to find happiness. Now, I wonder, uh, in, in the... Say in show business, if you find people who are unhappy, who are anxious or fearful, how much of it is due to a lack of self-knowledge or self-honesty, for example? Well, I think uh, most all of it is. Uh, there are some performers who could be in show business for a hundred years and never get anywhere, but they're not honest with themselves, so they continue along the line, uh, hoping that someday they might make it. Uh, but uh, talent is a gift from God, and if right. you don't have that gift, uh, you might become a pseudo entertainer. You might be able to fool an audience, but it's very difficult to work. But if you have the gift, it's hardly any effort at all. It's like we say in San Juan Hill, where I came from, as we called it, San Juan Hill. You gotta got it. That's true. Uh, I think that everyone is given the gift of, of uh, believing in God from the moment they're born. And it is only the abuse of this gift that finally destroys it. Uh, I think you can cultivate it 
And I think you can even uh, reinstall your faith. Even if you have destroyed it from years of, uh, of uh, not giving it any attention. And I think that's the wonderful thing about religion, that you never really lose it. It's always there. And if you just turn to it, you can accomplish what it uh, asks of you. Jackie, you know what, what is also <clears throat> interesting here? That in the area of um, modern probings of the human personality, there, ha there have been some people uh, who have said that uh, guilt feelings are due to an over uh, emphasis on, on sin. And so they would say that you got to um, sing the song, There Ain't No Sin, and forget about sin and just do what you please. Now, even if they say these things and they act in accord with this uh, self-hypnosis, would this destroy guilt feelings? It would be impossible to destroy guilt feelings. Uh, but I think that it's very important <clears throat> that you feel guilty uh, about your sins. That's the only way you'll be aware that you are a sinner. And as it's been pointed out, God uh, hates sin, but he loves a sinner. Uh, you must feel guilty uh, throughout your life, or you, you're a vegetable. It yeah. would be impossible not to feel guilt. No, I, could, I suppose, Jack, there, there must be some middle ground there somewhere, too, isn't there? I suppose if a man were to sort of beat himself mercilessly for his past behavior, he could become almost scrupulous, couldn't he? There'd be another, uh, almost a twisting... Well, uh, those are the extremes. Yes. But, Jackie, could, could it uh, be possible that anybody uh, with an uneasy conscience, uh, like last we were talking about the suppression into the, uh, into the, uh, the conscience, uh, suppression of uh, responsibility, a person pretends he's, he's not guilty. Is it possible for a person to have happiness with a bad conscience? I don't think so. I think that you could... Uh, I think that that, incidentally, is the mistake of psychiatry. Tell me, uh, I'd like to hear this. Uh, I think the difference between... Uh, a lot of people uh, evaluate psychiatry and religion as being the same thing, uh, as a palliative for life. <clears throat> but it isn't so. Uh, psychiatry will tell you that you have uh, a boil on your psyche. and will tell you how you got it. Uh -huh. But they don't tell you how to get rid of it. They just tell you to ignore it. Religion is a little different. It tells you that you have a boil on your soul, tells you why you have it, and tells you how to get rid of it, yeah. which is more important than ignoring it. I think one of my, my priest friends, who is, by the way, a psychologist, he, he claims that um, psychiatry is interested in psychological guilt in the unconscious mind, and religion is concerned with moral guilt in the conscious mind. And there'd be two different I think areas. That's, I think that's, uh, that's it. Maybe this is why when you have these, uh, these uh, unending programs of discussions when people will try to, to uh, uh, sort of uh, harmonize religion and the psychiatrist's couch, they say, for example, the Catholic, the confessional box, they say, is the same as the, as the psychiatrist's couch. You Catholics go to confession to a priest for nothing and I pay 25 bucks an hour, a 45-minute hour. Uh, this is obviously incorrect. Don't well, you think so? <laughs> first of all, what you get in the, <clears throat> in the confessional is priceless. Uh, 25 bucks alongside of the, uh, the result and consequences of going to confession is uh, a ridiculous uh, uh, assumption. Uh, a psychiatrist uh, has gone to his god, uh, another analyst, you know, he's stepped into confessional too. And uh, it's, you must have a bridge between uh, God and yourself. If only, uh, I think that you can reach God without an intermediary. But I think that there is a humbleness uh, about relying upon someone to help you reach yeah, God. Yeah. I think that's very necessary. Yeah. I think you're taking on uh, uh, too heroic an attitude to, to say, I'll find God all by myself. Well, Jackie, you know, I was going to ask you something like that. Uh, I have met people who have given the impression anyway that they are the ultimate quarterback uh, in their lives. And the person says, I call all the shots about myself. And I just wonder, isn't this uh, sort of a kind of a self-divinization? Uh, I, I wonder, uh, in the long run, is there any such thing as a, as a totally self-reliant person? Or isn't it when a person says, I don't need nobody, is this not an expression of immaturity? I think when somebody gets to the point where they believe they are absolutely self-sustaining, 
that they begin to lose confidence in themselves. You can't uh, possibly believe that you can go through life without the assistance of something, mm -hmm. some kindness, some generosity from, from outside. And uh, there's only way, one way to get uh, help and generosity, and that is to give it. And it's just like playing handball. You give generosity and it bounces right back to you. Uh, I suppose that's a, a stupid uh, way of saying Not at all. casting bread upon the water, but that's what it is. Uh, I think one of the, the great graces uh, of living a life is generosity. If you can give something to someone, uh, no matter what it is, whether it's material uh, things or some spiritual assistance. It's very, very important. It's what friendship is based on. Is yes. The fact that uh, a, a friend gives you confidence, uh, gives you maturity, uh, gives you your opinion that you are intelligent. And this might sound as if it were uh, uh, one-sided, but of course this friend is on the other end, receiving the same thing from you. Yes. And I think that that should be the relationship between a human being and his God, is that he should give to God. And if it happens in every other instance, why shouldn't it happen that God will give you back love? It's fabulous, Jackie, actually. You know, and it leads me to a little thought I have along these lines that you, you mentioned before about the need for humility, uh, that a man must have humility. And I was thinking that there was a great Spanish mystic, one of my favorite gals, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, who uh, equated humility with truth, uh, not with the craven, uh, supine aspect that we often talk about, the meek Uriah heap, yes. but she said that humility is truth and it is the, the, the rugged honesty of self-acceptance. Uh, and then, as you're saying here, the, the, the basic acceptance really is the acceptance of a supreme being, isn't it? That's right. Uh, humility has always been... Uh, a thorn in my side. Uh, you see, I have a, a, a terrific ego. I believe I am very, very good at what I do. Well, and I think that any performer who, who claims to be humble and sometimes hire press agents to prove it yeah. mm -hmm. are uh, being commercially naivete. Uh, a performer can't believe himself talented enough to walk in front of millions of people each week and with the intention of charming them, right. entertaining them, and, and making them that. love him yeah. without realizing Correct. inside of himself that, that he has this talent. Uh, the thing is, if the only thing that's that, that real humility is to realize that this talent is a gift, that you aren't the manufacturer of it, and that you aren't the, the sole reason that it's there. Uh, but to say that you haven't got the gift, that, that's dishonest, isn't it? Well, guys run around saying five years of loyal service. Well, if they can brag about that watch, I can certainly brag about a gift that I got from the boss. I think I have a perfect right to do that. I think, I, think I would be doing other than the right thing if I didn't. I think that's magnificent, Jackie. As a matter of fact, I think that's marvelously spiritual. And I, I have as my authority for this St. Paul. <laughs> that all through, uh, you know, my, my patron of the Paul's father, St. Paul, all the way through his, his letters, he's saying to the people to whom he writes, I wish you were like me, he says. You know, this is not being an egotist. This is a man who recognizes that he does love Jesus and that since he loves him, he wishes everybody else did too. And it would seem to me as a priest and as a Catholic that if, if I were to pretend I didn't have a gift, when I know darn well I do, uh, this would be an affront to the generous Lord who has given you such a great talent. That's true, and I also think that uh, the difficulty that a priest has with his uh, flock is because he is an expert on the subject. They won't believe him. Yeah, I know. They would uh, perhaps rather believe me. They certainly will. Through my stupidity, which is a ridiculous thing to do than to believe an expert, someone who has studied it and knows uh, from his association with his religion that what he's saying is so. I stumble around and use uh, uh, not unassailable logic in any uh, manner, shape, or form, but just uh, the most common sense logic. 
And for someone to place uh, belief in what I say is certainly not the, uh, the brightest thing to do. I think that uh, you should leave it to the experts and you should let them get through to you and let them instill and plant some uh, intelligence within you so that you can cultivate it. I, I suppose, Jackie, that people uh, have this unconscious feeling that priests aren't people. These guys with these funny they collars. They're computers. Uh, it must be computers. I guess we sort of came out someplace and uh, just came just as is, fully blown, you know, with wearing yes. these strange clothes. We must be Hindus or something. I think a priest is uh, perhaps more human than an ordinary human because he realizes his responsibility so much more than the ordinary person. He'd be a pretty poor kind of a priest if he weren't human, and if he didn't empathize and sympathize with people. That's so. Just like, you know, Jackie, my, my friend Teresa of Avila says that, that a sad saint is a sad sort of a saint. I think so, too. You know, if you're going to be sad all the time and uh, depressed, with a pretty crummy type of spirituality. And that's another thing about Catholicism. They think that it's such a, a dire way of life that it's so solemn and so uh, a step in its opinions and that it's a, a rugged road to travel. Uh, the consequences of, of sin, to think of them as a rugged thought. But the church isn't that so serious that there's no laughter or no enjoyment or no uh, pleasantries in it. There are. I can't think of anything more pleasant than to go into a church uh, loaded with sin go to confession and come out. Terrific feeling. Believing that uh, you're getting another chance. Right. You couldn't find anything more pleasant than that. And this is, this is uh, something you can't buy, isn't it? You couldn't get this anywhere else. Well, see, that's, we get back to the $25 psychiatrist again. It's a 45-minute hour. You can't, you can't buy it. But Jackie, there, is, there are so many things I, I really wanted to talk to you about. And I, this, this business of uh, humility, it seems to me, uh, which you have so beautifully expressed before, is such a basic thing. I, I, I like your approach about yourself and about anybody else. You know, if I could give you an example, Jackie, in the seminary, we used to have an expression we called humility with a hook. That is, a fellow would do something good, let me say I and my candy would go up and say, say, gee, Jack, that was a great job you did. And he would say to me, oh, no, it was terrible. And then I'd say, no, it was good. What he was saying to me was, tell me again. Yes. So this, this was a form of dishonesty, which I would find uh, very incompatible with the role of a Christian. So your expression, your recognition of the fact that you or anybody else who has a talent, uh, this is very spiritual from the point of view of priests of Avila, uh, Jesus, the faith itself. And I think also that there are very few people that haven't got some talent. It might not be apparent to them right away, but I think if kids uh, who are supposed juvenile delinquents, which is a ridiculous thing to say about a, a delinquent that he's juvenile. I see nothing juvenile about a 15-year-old kid hitting someone over the head with a chain. Mm -hmm. It's just as serious if someone 90 years old mm -hmm. were using a chain. Just as much dead, isn't he? Oh, yeah, he's, uh, he can't get any deader than when yeah. you get hit with a chain. But um, I think that if these kids uh, really searched themselves for some particular talent, they would find it. And that's so important to have a dream, to, uh, to have some direction in your life. Otherwise, it's, it's meaningless, and uh, the best you can do is sit around and, and hope something fortunate will happen to you, which isn't the case. You know, Jackie, the premise we're talking about here seems to me to be so important. The business about... Uh, the relationship of the creature with the creator, this tender link between you and your God. And from what I can see, a lot of people are unhappy, these delinquents or whoever they are, they're unhappy because they don't feel uh, that they are worth anything. They don't feel significant. And if a person could be absorbed in what you were talking about, the business that God loves him, uh, it seems to me that this would make a tremendous difference in a person's attitude. That if I have value, God loves me. Even if I'm a complete jerk, which I would refuse to admit, even if I am a complete jerk, God still loves me, and I must have some value. What do you think about an idea like that? Well, it's true. You see, a, a kid today will join a gang to gain the respect of his friends and the leader of the gang. Now, that uh, respect vacillates 
because of his performance of uh, respect for the leader or what he can do for his gang. While God's uh, uh, way of returning respect and duty is everlasting and it doesn't vacillate. God remembers the good things you've done. Even if you've done a hundred wrong things after the one good thing, he'll remember that. And uh, you'll get as much credit for it uh, as you received when you first committed the good act. And if it could only be, uh, if it could only be made to be understood by, by children, that this great friend is there, mm -hmm. this great leader, who always gives you full credit for everything you do, and that credit is never taken away, I'm sure that they would uh, begin to switch leaders. What's the old expression, Jackie? You take one step towards God, and he takes a thousand towards you. That's right. And uh, I don't think you ever step backward from God after taking a step toward him. I think you remain in the same place. I think he tolerates your uh, sins, but he leaves you in the same spot so that you never lose the distance. You, you, you're always advancing. You might hold, you might stay in one spot for a while, uh, but you don't lose your advantages. You keep going. Jackie, if I, if I want to try to make uh, excuses from my fellow man, who, those who might slip up here or there, in regard to what they call evil, uh, the evil thing, uh, does evil change uh, with circumstances, with eras? Uh, is what was wrong yesterday right today or vice versa? Is this possible? I don't think so. Not with the real things, the important things. It might with uh, insignificant things. Uh, the church right now is trying to decide about birth control. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure their decision will not change their original idea of birth yes. control. But we'll try to find an answer to the problem within uh, the correct thinking about uh, birth control. And I think the same thing applies to sins today. Uh, we might think that we're living in a time that, uh, that gives us more latitude to do what we please or to at least enjoy life a little better because we're undertaking this great burden. But it doesn't. The burdens haven't changed and the consequence of evil hasn't changed. Uh, if you hurt someone, it's just as serious now as it was many, many years ago. And uh, I think if you realize that, you'd be less likely to uh, to live a life that uh, hasn't any generosity to it or kindness. People are afraid to be uh, sentimental today. It's too bad, isn't it? It sure is, because uh, they say it's corny. Well, strangely enough, being corny is being truthful. Uh, what you say is so vanilla mm. that they say it has no taste to it. But it's truth. This uh, is the thing. You're expressing yourself in an honest way. And people will say, well, he's corny, he's, he's square. Might be so, but uh, it's a good way to be. Whereas the, the person you might call a pseudo-sophisticate uh, covers himself up with this uh, three-inch layer so that you don't really see him. He keeps you away from himself by this, uh, this so-called avant-garde thinking. Well, he a sophisticate uh, always arms himself with arguments and answers. And all of the answers are uh, connected with his arguments. There aren't answers to anything else but his arguments. While I think a simple person will not argue, but ask for mm -hmm. instruction, ask for intelligence, rather than try to force their supposed intelligence on you and make you think the way they think. Um, I think you become a much better person if you listen Jackie, talking about listening, uh, I haven't really got very much time left, but I'd love to get your thinking on this. Uh, about listening to other people, you and I are Catholics, and I say I'm half Jewish and half Catholic, but ecumenically uh, in the world, uh, there's great progress being made. You know that we are listening to each other now, instead of yelling at each other, That's instead right. of trying to beat the other guy down and show him how wrong he is and how right we are. How do you think it's going ecumenically? in your business, for example? I think that uh, the fact that the church is listening 
to everyone. Instead of trying to uh, give the answers to everyone, continuously. Yes. That it makes the church appear more human to most people. And for that very reason, I think, more people will begin to join the church. It's not uh, such an austere facade that you're staring at all the time. It's a human, kind, warm uh, way of life and way of thought that I think you'd like to jo join rather than uh, be fearful of and step mm -hmm. back from. Jackie, do you know that things are going so fast in the church that there is a, a movement that women might be ordained priests? Isn't that I voila? saw where uh, in the in some article where uh, a woman had, uh, was serving communion. This is uh, sort of uh, very fantastic, isn't it? And yet uh, the church is wide open. Well, I don't know how fantastic it is. After all, everyone's uh, created equal, and I should imagine along with that would go the duties of humanity, that they should be shared equally amongst everyone. And uh, I guess it uh, won't be long before uh, women are taking on the duties that priests... Uh, well, we had a, a woman here in this show last summer who said that she felt within 100 years it's a certainty. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be a certainty before that. Well, Jackie, I, I want to thank you so very much for coming. I see we're running out of time, and believe me, you have, you have made, I think, an extremely significant contribution to thinking about something which is not narrowly denominational. It's much broader than that. You have done a great deal to help us. Thank you so much. Well, I think that I approve one thing, that uh, the church is so strong that it can withstand and advocate like myself. <laughs> Jackie, you're great. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, Jackie, thanks so much. Thank you for watching, and on behalf of the Paulus Fathers and NBC and everybody around, we thanks, thank you so much for watching us. We hope you enjoyed it. I'm sure you did. Think about what Jackie said. He offered an awful lot. Again, thanks for watching, and until next time, be good, and may you walk with the God who loves you. This has been Inquiry, produced by WNBC-TV Public Affairs in cooperation with the Archdiocese of New York and the Paulist Fathers. Our topic today, Jackie Gleason Talks Religion, the second of two conversations with our special guest, Jackie Gleason, and Father James Lloyd.